So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Garcia. I'm from Karlstad University in Sweden. And I'm here today to talk to you about deterministic network emulation in Linux. And we call that Kaunet M. So we have worked a bit previously with deterministic network emulation, but that has been in FreeBSD. And now we are looking to move that functionality also to Linux. So this is the outline of my talk today. I will first just describe what we mean by deterministic network emulation. I will provide some use case examples to show you why we consider it to be useful. Uh, I will discuss the system design, give you a short demo of the functionality, discuss some open issues, and conclude with how we view the way forward and some closing remarks. So, deterministic network emulation. With that, uh, we mean <coughs> emulation that allows the experiment <coughs> sorry, not only to generate various uh, effects, but uh, to place these effects at precisely controlled places in space or time. And uh, in the case of space, this uh, correlates to the packet uh, loss number or the, the packet numbering. So we can say that we want to have an emulation effect at the 15th packet in a flow or the second or the 354th or whatever. Or we can control the uh, emulation effects in time to specify them at particular points in time, as we will see. So uh, how can we use this? A typical emulation setup is either a physical emulation setup as shown in the top part or a virtual emulation setup as shown in the lower part. With a physical emulation setup, we have a dedicated machine with at least uh, two network interfaces that does the applying of the emulation effects, create the extra loss or induces the packet losses or has some rate restrictions. So. Uh, that is one way of doing it. Alternatively, we can use a virtual emulation setup and we do uh, everything inside one computer. We have the receiver and the sender and we have some uh, type of network uh, between these and that network can be more or less complicated and can be realized with virtual machines or with uh, network namespaces, for example. So, if we consider how uh, we actually employ emulation for the physical case, so in the middle we have the machine with NetM and the hosts that do the communication. So, to use NetM as it stands today, we use TC to configure the emulation effects that we want to apply, be that packet loss rate or delay or rate restrictions or duplications. So that it is how it is done today. Uh, with TC, we can also specify the use of a particular delay distribution file if we want our um, packet losses to have some particular distribution like normal distribution or Pareto distribution or something like that. Additionally, it is also possible to use the tool make table to create your own uh, dedicated tables with some distribution that you are interested of having. These can be uh, sourced either from traces that you have collected on the network, or you can use analytical expressions to come up with the distributions that you want to have, or you can take them from simulation results or handcraft your distributions uh, if you need some particular uh, uh, way of, of uh, having a, a distribution. However, the important thing to consider here is that what you get is a distribution. So you get a probabilistic behavior. You know that, okay, my delay will follow this distribution, but you have no control of which delay is applied to the individual packets, only that they have some probability of having some particular delay. So that is basically what we want to change. And how do we do that? Well, in this setup, we instead exchange the delay distribution that we saw earlier here with a pattern file. So now, 
we have a pattern file which has a loss pattern or a, a rate pattern or a delay pattern. And this pattern file is constructed with a pattern utility. And this can then use the same sources as before. And with this pattern, then you can control exactly when the emulation effects are applied. So you can control for each packet if you want, uh, if it should be dropped or not, or which rate it should have. Uh, the CowNet um, framework allows us to uh, control it in two different dimensions, as I mentioned earlier. These are uh, data-driven mode and time-driven mode. So for the data-driven mode, the pattern file specifies uh, what emulation effect or how the emulation effect should be applied on the basis of individual packets. So in this case, the pattern file says that this particular packet should be lost and this particular packet should be lost. So here, uh, this is of course independent of time. It just uh, depends on when packets happen to occur. The other way of specifying uh, the application of emulation effects is to use time-driven mode. In that case, we have particular points in time where we say that at these points in time, we change the state of the emulation effects. So if we use a loss pattern, then we say that at this point in time, we start to lose all packets that arrive after that time. So that would be this packet. Then we have a period of not losing packets, and then a period again of losing packets. And uh, in the current implementation, we use a millisecond as uh, the boundary for uh, creating new um, time slots. <coughs> so uh, this allows uh, quite some flexibility. Uh, however, it, it is not possible to have both of these running uh, at the same time. So either you have data-driven mode or you have time-driven mode. So what emulation effects can we apply? Well, these are, this is a list of the emulation effects that are currently implemented. So we can control packet losses, and that can be either data-driven or time-driven. We can control the addition of delay, <coughs> and we can do that in data-driven or time-driven mode. <coughs> the same applies for changes to the rate. We have the functionality to insert bit errors, and that is only possible to do in the data-driven mode. And the bit error functionality is done in such a way that you can specify which pattern should have a bit error, and you can also specify which bit in that packet should be flipped. <coughs> but you can only uh, flip one bit uh, currently. This is the same or similar functionality that is available for NetM, just with the difference that for NetM, the position of the bit flip is randomly decided. <coughs> so we also have the application uh, capabilities that is also coming from NetM, and this can be controlled in a data-driven or time-driven fashion. Uh, reordering can also be controlled, and we can specify the amount of reordering that we want to have. And finally, we have trigger patterns. So this is some functionality that is not available in uh, regular NetM. And the idea with trigger pattern is, is that it's a mechanism to allow the generation of uh, like cross-layer signaling. Uh, so what happens here if you have a trigger pattern is that the emulator will generate a UDP packet and send that to a particular IP address. And uh, on that IP address, your application can listen. And we have an adaptation layer that then mm, makes the semantic interpretation of this. And one example where this can be useful can be, for example, in delay-tolerant networking, where you would like to emulate some link layer signaling that now you have some connectivity so you should start your transmissions. 
So this can be realized with uh, trigger patterns. And uh, we intend to implement this in the data-driven way and possibly also for a time-driven mode. <clears throat> so this is a range of, of the emulation effects that are available. So now we come to some use case examples. So how can we use this? How have deterministic emulation been used before? <clears throat> well, we considered several uh, cases. Of course, it is very useful to use this kind of functionality if you want to uh, validate your implementation. So uh, you want to make sure that your transport protocol implementation conforms to the specification. You need to test a lot of cases. And uh, for example, you might want to test uh, the tail loss probing functionality. Uh, <clears throat> so that can be uh, useful and then you need to be able con to control exactly where the packet losses happen. So that is possible with deterministic emulation. Uh, you might come up with a new transport layer mechanism for some transport protocol that you want to evaluate. Then of course it's uh, very useful to have the ability to precisely control the conditions that the transport protocol sees. Uh, you can also evaluate various uh, applications uh, and see how they work under different conditions and where you can deterministically recreate these conditions uh, with a high level of control. So for example, if you are considering some uh, uh, VoIP application performance, then you can create traces that uh, add amounts of jitters, in, uh, not in a random way, <coughs> but in a deterministic way. And as a general observation, we can see that when you do evaluations, it's good to try to control what you can, and then you randomize the rest. So with deterministic network emulation, uh, this allows you to uh, control slightly more than is possible without deterministic network emulation. And that uh, can be a good thing. And one illustration of this is what we see here. So this is an evaluation of how much impact um, changes of the initial window of TCP has um, <clears throat> for some particular bandwidth and delay. And what we see on the i-axis is the flow completion time for a fairly short flow. And on the x-axis is a number of replications, so 30 replications. And here we had uh, also losses uh, when we ran these experiments. And of course, the results is uh, highly dependent on whether or not we happen to have a packet loss for each particular replication. So when we have a packet loss, we get very high values. And we run this over an emulated link where the losses are inserted randomly. So we don't have any uh, control over that, which means that when we make a run with one setting, we may get a loss or we may not get a loss. And then we change the setting to another configuration and run the experiment again. And then we may get a loss or may not get a loss. Uh, we can only specify a particular loss rate for the link. So this is the way it is done if you don't have deterministic emulation. <clears throat> Uh, an alternative approach is instead of having random losses, we generate loss patterns. So we generate 30 patterns because we have 30 replications. And in these patterns, we randomly place losses. And then we apply the same pattern for both different configuration options. And if you do that, then the results look like this. So here we see that there is somewhat more tighter coupling to the behavior. So in this case, the pattern uh, has a loss at some particular position. So we get an increase in the flow completion time for both configurations. In some cases, there is a difference that is due to how to the particular configuration. So that depends on 
where and the loss happened uh, in inside the flow at which at which position so now instead of having totally random losses we still have randomly placed losses but we have them placed at exactly the same positions for both configuration options so is this uh, then uh, beneficial or not well if you calculate the difference between these different configurations options for the initial window then you end up with this so what you see here is the mean difference between uh, the the mean of the 30 replications and this is for the paired case so where we have our loss patterns and then we see that we have a mean indifference of 200 milliseconds and that it's statistically significant at this particular uh, significance level that is used here, which is 5% uh, uh, significance or 95% confidence. Whereas if we instead look at the first uh, case where we just had random losses of, of, on the link, <coughs> then we see a very small difference in the means and a considerably larger confidence interval. And of course, this is because the effect of the random packet losses is confounding the effect of the uh, parameter change that we are examining. So this is um, an illustration to show that using uh, uh, patterns can provide an increased statistical strength if you are evaluating some particular parameter change. Over here we see the results for uh, another uh, configuration setup with a much higher delay. And here, uh, of course, we see an effect for uh, both approaches, uh, deterministic or non-deterministic uh, losses. But for the non-deterministic losses, the uh, confidence interval is quite a bit larger. So this is one illustration of how uh, pattern-based uh, uh, control can be useful uh, in the evaluation. So <clears throat> here we have another illustration. What is done here is that we have a flow uh, uh, of 21 packets and we want to transmit it. <clears throat> and now instead of uh, having the losses placed randomly, we can we place a loss at each um, position in the flow. So and then we measure the transmission time uh, of the flow. And of course, we see that if we lose the very first packet, then we have a much higher transmission time because we need to make a, a timeout for the SYN, which is, takes uh, quite a bit of lo longer time. And then for the later packets, uh, we see that the uh, amount of flow completion time is, of course, much lower because the the recuperation from the packet loss is much faster. And then in the end, we see that, OK, in this case, we are examining uh, if you change the value of the early uh, retransmit parameter in the Linux sys control, uh, what actually happens in the end. And we see that if you turn off the tail loss probe and uh, early retransmit mechanisms, then if you happen to have uh, a loss at the end of a TCP flow, then the flow completion time will take a considerable hit. Whereas if you have uh, the TLP and the ER turned on, then it works uh, quite a bit better and it's just for the final uh, packet that you will have an extra delay. So this is one way to, to validate that the, ex the behavior that you expect for, from a transport protocol is actually occurring. So uh, now I'll cover a little bit about the Kaunet system design. So uh, as we saw earlier, we have TC to do the, the pattern loading, and we have Patyan to do the uh, pattern creation. This is done in user space. And uh, we have added, as you can see, the orange part here is uh, stuff that is mm, uh, NetM and Kaunet joint, and red part is just KNetM. So, uh, pattern and table management, um, 
uh, is, is uh, reusing part of the functionality from the loading of the distribution table, so we didn't have to do all that from scratch. Uh, however, we did the pattern decoding and forwarding because we have to represent the amount of uh, um, rate that we want to have or what particular uh, level of, of uh, losses that we want to have. And this is encoded, as we will see for, uh, shortly, in a particular way. So that is decoded uh, in the kernel. And then we have the individual emulation effects that are applied as traffic goes by. So here we use these emulation effects that are already available in NetM, and we just uh, change their parameters at particular points uh, in time or when a particular number of packets have been seen. So how do we represent the data? So this is shown here for the case where we need to represent large values. So this is the case for bandwidth patterns or delay patterns. And we have designed a, a, a format where we can have an 11-bit mantissa and a 4-bit exponent um, if we have a value. And if we instead want to specify, OK, how long is it uh, until we should change the value the next time? So if we want to say that, OK, after 1,000 packets, we should set a new value. Then we specify the run length value here, and then we specify a new value here, and the interpretation is, of course, uh, controlled by the flag value over there. So with this particular way of representing the data, we can represent rates from zero bits per second up to two bet petabits per second. So hopefully this should uh, hold out for, for some wi while in the future. O also with delays, we ha can represent them to the order of uh, years, so that shouldn't be a problem. However, you could think about, okay, uh, only using 11 bits for the mantissa, uh, what will that do to the accuracy that you can achieve? So in fact, that shouldn't be uh, any major problem, as we can see here. So this shows the representation error for a range of values between 1 and 10. So if you want to specify that, OK, I need to have a rate of uh, 20.57 megabits per second, that cannot be represented exactly. Instead, that will have to be rounded up, in this case, to, to 20.5. So then we are just here. So in this case, the max, the worst case in, in inefficiency in the representation is around 0.25%. And we consider that to be quite acceptable, given that the emulation framework in itself has some um, level of in inaccuracy. Uh, and again, this is only if you have these very uneven numbers. So of course, if you need to have like 2, 3, 4, or 20, something like that, then and that is without any representation error at all. OK, so looking at the other ways of uh, representing data, we can see that if we uh, have packet data, we just have a run length value to control when the packet loss should be applied. And um, something to note here is that due to how the patterns are loaded into the kernel with TC currently. There is a limit on 16 of 16 kilobytes for the patterns, which means that we can only have a, a, a restricted number of packet losses. So uh, in this example, if we have a 0.1% packet loss rate at 100 milli megabytes per second, uh, then we can run for 24 minutes uh, that before we exhaust uh, the pattern. We can also represent integers for reordering bit errors and these trigger patterns that I mentioned. And that is done in a similar way to the float representation. So what, we di what did we need to do to implement this? Well, it turned out that it, we didn't need to change a lot of uh, code inside the kernel. Uh, in this case, we start by looking at the user code extensions and uh, for TC, we just added some code to do uh, the loading and transfer of the patterns. And then we have the patch gen utility, which takes care of uh, 
generating these encoded patterns, uh, I.O. related to that. And this is the <coughs> some of the comments that can be used with Patient. So we specify which type of pattern we should generate. And we can specify a list of values directly on the command line or read them from a file. Um, and there are some particular options for packet losses. So uh, we can set uh, here the fraction of packet losses that we want to have, so 0.5% or 0.2% or whatever. Or alternatively, we can say how many losses do we want to have for this particular pattern. So we say that, OK, we generate a pattern that is covering 1,000 packets, and we want to make sure that there are exactly two losses in, for these 1,000 packets but the losses can be randomly placed. So is there really a difference between specifying a 0 0.2 packet loss probability or specifying that you should have two losses per 1,000 packets? Well, it turns out that, yes, there is quite a, a bit of a difference. So for the case where you specify the packet loss probability, then, in fact, what you will get is something that looks like this. So for a given 1,000 packet flow with a 0 0.2 loss probability, then on average, on average, you should get uh, two losses because you have 0 0.2 percent over 1,000 packets. But for any individual flow, the probability uh, of the number of losses that that flow sees is shown here. So in fact, it's almost as pros probable that you will get just one loss as uh, the case where you get two losses. And it's mm, also the case that uh, on approximately one in seven uh, of the flows, uh, which has this specification, will not see any packet loss at all. And of course, if you are trying to evaluate the behavior when packet losses occur, if no packet losses occur, then what are you actually evaluating? So of course, alternatively, we can specify that, OK, for a particular pattern size, we say that there should be two losses. And then you know that in 100% of the cases, there will be two losses. So then you know what you are actually evaluating. OK, so uh, scheduling, um, we had to do some work on that. and. Uh, the NetM itself, of course, we did some modifications. So uh, just some brief demonstration. So what we see here is a script where we do some data-driven packet loss test. And uh, I don't we have the control comments for the script. And we want to place the losses at positions 3, 5, and 10. And when we run that, well, as we w expected, we have lost the packets at position 3, uh, 5, and 10. Uh, another uh, example is where we can have a reordering. So here, we specify that packet number 2 should be reordered five places, and packet number three should be reordered uh, one place. And when we run that, we see that uh, that is actually what is happening. So if we look at the sequence numbers, we see one, and then four, because packet number three should be reordered, and we have packet number two down here. So this is one example of how we can control uh, these different emulation effects. So what are the open issues uh, with KNETM? Well, things that we haven't decided yet is what should happen at the end of a pattern. Uh, 
for now, it just ends, but we could add functionality for wraparound or appending additional pat um, patterns. Another issue, what should happen when we have a change in the configured rate? So this is uh, basically tied to the question if we should be able to change the rate when a packet is being transmitted or not. Um, if we, uh, so that is also something that we need to decide on. Uh, also, we uh, are considering if we should add additional pattern types. Uh, that is one open issue. And we have some architectural issues, so should we perhaps uh, fold the patent code into TC instead of having a separate uh, common line utility for that? And should we maybe split the delay pattern functionality to two different types of patterns? So that could be uh, delays where reordering can uh, happen if you have a very large variation in the configured delay, or and one other variation is where you have FIFO, so regardless of what you set the delay for the individual packets, reordering cannot occur. So that is also a possibility. Uh, when we implemented this the way that we did, uh, we chose NetM because that meant that we didn't have to add a lot of code. We could reuse much of the functionality that is already available in NetM. Some uh, disadvantages of NetM is that we cannot nest uh, the NetM queue disk. So if you want to have a particular ordering of when you apply the different effects, that cannot be achieved. Um, so that is one uh, uh, drawback. Uh, so there are some uh, alternatives of implementing this uh, deterministic emulation functionality. And we are very interested to hear if somebody has some suggestions of, of other ways of doing it. That would be very helpful. So uh, what will we do in the future? We will continue to add code functionality. This is a work in progress. So we have a working version, but that version still has some bugs that we need to iron out. And we will uh, provide documentation and examples and so on. Uh, and we are also considering to integrate this into the core emulator and maybe have a look if we can uh, do something uh, nice with LNST uh, as well. And of course, we are interested in any contributions, so bug reports, code patches, feature requests that are more than welcome. So to conclude, I'd like to say that we believe that deterministic emulation has an important role to, fi uh, to fill for networking researchers and protocol implementers. And uh, CaunetM is one way of achieving deterministic emulation, and we hope we will be able to make it easy to use and well documented for those that are interested. And with that note, I would like to conclude and open up for any questions. You can see here my uh, mail address and the mail address of Per Huttig, who is my collaborator on this, and in fact, the, the person who has been uh, implementing most of the code. Uh, we have a, a Git repo with uh, the current state of the code and some documentation available, uh, as you can see here. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Traffic, the, the net and net and not, and if you use traffic, see the capacity of the computation. The, are you able to guarantee the dynasty? No, so if you, if you add traffic uh, at a faster rate than w what the computational resources allow, then we cannot de uh, gen uh, guarantee any determinism. No, so, so, so there is some performance limit. And, but as we view it, this, we, we, we don't think that the primary use case for deterministic emulation will be for, for extremely high-speed links. So hopefully it won't be a problem.